Welcome to June's A to J Author New User Webinar. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Author's Project Manager. With me today is my guest presenter, Angela Tripp. She's the Director of Michigan Legal Health and a Co-Managing Attorney of Michigan Poverty Law Program. Angela is going to talk about how her prep program manages a catalog of over 20 A to J guide interviews, how they're converting those interviews from A to J 4 to A to J 6, and some of the project management tools that she uses in that conversion process. Before we begin, we need your input. This is a link to a survey that we've put out in order to gather your input on future feature additions to A to J Author. We're really seeking what you think is working in A to J Author 6, what you don't think is working, what you missed from A to J 4, and what future feature requests and additions you'd like to see in the latest version of our software. We'll keep this open till, uh, for about another week or so, so near the end of June. Then we'll review the request and figure out a timeline for implementation of those in the future. So please fill out that survey and um, get me that feedback also anytime throughout the year. We're happy to hear from you. So next is our guest, Angela Tripp, and she'll begin with her slide deck. So just as a, a refresher then to why um, Angela would be here and why we're talking about A to J4 to 6 conversions, um, A to J4 was written in Flash. The majority of guided interviews that are on Law Help Interactive, the national server that hosts, that hosts A to J guided interviews and hot docs templates, um, the majority of those interviews are written in A to J4, and Flash is quickly being deprecated across the internet. It's getting increasingly difficult to have Flash run automatically on, in a browser, um, and many browsers are starting to turn off support for it, and it will be end of life um, sometime in 2019, I believe. So there's a lot of work that goes into making sure that your interviews are still um, valid law and that they still work. So this is the time to get working on that now before it's too late and your interviews just don't work anymore um, on the internet. So I am gonna turn over um, the presenter mode to Angela and she will be able to walk you through her slides then. So Angela, if you wanna introduce yourself for anything while I change presenter. Sure, um, as Jessica said, my name is Angela Tripp. Um, I'm the director of Michigan Legal Help. I've been doing this um, since about uh, 2010. And so I've had lots of um, time to learn. I started out not knowing anything, um, <laughs> gradually learned a lot more. Um, and so I finally feel like I'm at a point where I might be able to help other people um, who are managing document assembly libraries. And so um, when we applied for this TIG with Cali, um, uh, we decided to write in um, some, uh, some additional funds for my program to provide help to other um, states and organizations who need to do the conversion process and maybe don't have as many resources as we do um, so that we could use some of our resources to help other people get their interviews migrated. So um, I'm going to go through um, just a pretty quick presentation and sort of talk to you about uh, how we recommend you handle your conversion process, um, what has worked for us, and uh, the ways that we can provide assistance to your projects. Because this is a really large undertaking, um, and we've known about it for a while, but it um, it, it's just a really large undertaking for a lot of reasons that I'll get into. But I want to tell everyone, like, you know, not to be um, too intimidated by it, that if it's, you know, you always can break it down into manageable bites and steps um, and get to the finish line. And we want to be able to help if we can. So here we go. So the steps um, that you need to take in taking on this project, and I view this as like as a big project. It's not just about the conversion. It's about maintaining your library, as Jessica said. So the first thing that we recommend doing is to make a list of all your A to J interviews and to, de to determine the future of each, because we all have a large library um, and you know some of those interviews maybe haven't been reviewed in a long time, some maybe don't really work. This is an opportunity to sort of clean up our libraries. I know that Law Help Interactive periodically tells us all that we need to clean up our libraries. It's very true. Um, and the worst thing that we could have is links to interviews that are broken 
outdated um, or just contain incorrect information. So go through all of your interviews. Um, you can easily get a list of them from um, the LHI data reports, or I'm sure Jessica could help you with that. And then make a, and then decide for each one. What are you going to do with that interview? Are you going to convert it to A to J6? Are you going to decommission it because it's um, unnecessary or so old that and you don't have the resources to bring it up to date? Um, are you going to rebuild it in A to J6? That's another option. If you don't want to deal with the conversion, if you have some simple interviews, you may choose to instead rebuild them in A to J6. And you might want to do that to take advantage of some of the new features of A to J6 um, uh, and their DAT tool. Um, or you can choose to rebuild something in another platform. Um, in Michigan, we had one interview that we thought really, if we had planned better, we would have done it in Hot Docs rather than A to J author uh, because of the complexity. Um, and so we're taking this opportunity to, to do that. And so that's the one interview um, that we're taking off of the A to J platform and rebuilding in using the Hot Docs interview interface. And once you've decided what interviews uh, you are going to convert, then it's the best practice to prioritize them. Um, considerations are the use. You know, you want to start with your most popular ones, um, but you also need to look at complexity. Uh, we don't recommend that you start with your most, your hardest interview, um, even if it's the most popular, because it's good to sort of, there is a learning curve to this whole process. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that you sort of start at a, at a good place. Um, look at the date that the tool was last reviewed. Um, do you know how? Do you know if the forms are still the correct forms? Um, is does a language need to be reviewed? Um, if you know an interview is going to need a lot of revisions, um, it's best to not put it as a high priority on the conversion, but you can prioritize it for um, getting that subject matter review, so that um, by the time the subject matter review is done. You've, you're ready to handle the conversion. And then if you have any external deadlines um, tied to any particular interview, um, you want to consider that as well. So you have to sort of weigh all of these factors and there's no magic formula, um, but uh, we recommend that you start with a few easy but popular interviews to get traction. So we started with our fee waiver. It's a fairly simple interview um, in terms of complexity. There's you know, there's only a one-page form to fill out. There's not a lot of loops. Um, there's not a lot of complex logic happening behind the scenes. And so we started with that one because it, it is very popular um, and, um, and and fairly easy. And so we we um, divided our tasks into, or we divided our interviews into priority groups A, B, C, D, and E, um, and sort of broke them into groups of like five interviews at a time um, so that, you know, we had multiple interviews in progress um, at a time, but, but it was controlled and we weren't just sort of faced with the whole wall of, um, of our interviews. So after you do that, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, I'm going to show you our Michigan um, tracking sheet in a little bit. Um, the next thing to do is to assign tasks and fill in the tracking sheet. Um, one of the things um, that, uh, sorry, I'm reading the chat menu. So Jessica's putting chats in there uh, about things that I'm talking. So the sample sorry, tracking sheet that I'm going to show you. No, that's okay. I should quit looking at the chats. <laughs> um, and you have links to all of these. Uh, Jessica's putting them in the um, in the chat box. So here are some, some tracking sheets that we put together that you can um, you can view these, but you can also, you know, uh, save as your own and adopt for your own system. So here's how um, a sample chart of the prioritization. Um, we would put the title of the interview and, and the link to the interview here for ease in looking at it. Um, we want to track the template IDs, who the developer is, and then for some of those, some of those, uh, you know, factors that we want to look at. Um, here are the assembly, you know, the number of assemblies in 2017, um, the conversion rate, whether this interview is easy, moderate, or complex in terms of logic. This is not necessarily how hard it is for the user, um, but really how, how complex the coding is, because uh, the test, the, the complexity of the coding is going to make the conversion uh, longer and harder to do. Not the conversion, the testing and the 
and the finalizing of the conversion harder to do. So that's what we really want to rank in this complexity box. Last reviewed, um, if you know a date when the interview was last looked at, um, and then you make the decision whether you want to migrate, rebuild in six, decommission, or move off to a different platform. If you have any grant-related deadlines, you can put them here, and then you can um, show your priority ranking here. So uh, I'll show you Michigan's chart. Um, this is, oh, this is the second chart, so let me not do that quite yet. Um, so then after you have, uh, you know, created your priori prioritization rankings, then you can um, use the other page in this, this Google uh, spreadsheet um, to make the assignment. Who's going to be responsible for what? And this uh, lets you track um, where things are in the long road to conversion. So uh, this is an awesome Google Doc created by uh, Brett Harrison. I don't know how he did this, but he like has these, um, he has all of your categories here, all the different possible statuses, not started, on hold, script sent, on deck, development, testing, vacuum QA, ready for live, live. And each of these changes the color of your row so that you can easily see where everything is in the process. So you'll put all of your interview names and links here in the rough priority ranking that you want to do them in. Put the priority ranking here and then decide who is the owner, who is the project manager who is responsible for moving this tool um, all the way through the process. Um, and then you're going to track, uh, I'm going to talk about these steps more later, but you'll track each of them with a date. So you can see this one, um, we sent the subject, the script to the subject matter expert. We got it back a month later. Um, the conversion in the initial testing was done and uh, we're in the testing and fixing phase right now. So that's why it's orange and it says testing. Um, and then when we do, um, make it live, we put that date here, and then if we change the, the IDs and the URLs, those go here, and then we have a space for notes at the end. Um, we recommend that you uh, um, add your test log document link here, and I'll talk more about that in a second as well. And so now I'll show you Michigan's, it will make a lot more sense. Um, so you can see um, uh, all of our links here to all of our interviews, the priority rankings that go um, A through, I guess I lied, we went to F. <laughs> A through F, um, there's that one that we're going to, um, oh no, this is the one that we're going to rebuild in Hot Docs. Um, and just, you know, the different dates that we did things, um, who is in charge of this interview, um, whether we changed the IDs, uh, we tried to put everything back up under the original A to J URL so that our uh, stats didn't change, but we have test links for things that we're in testing, and then links to our test log document. So, um, after you assign tasks and fill in the tracking sheet with your all of your interviews and owners, then you can go ahead and get started. And I know that I make that sound really simple, but I understand that it's really hard. Um, but really, it is once you get started, you just start plotting along on this process. Um, the conversion process, the steps in the conversion process. Um, the first one is to review the script and make edits. Um, I've had some conversations with people about whether it makes sense to do this first or last, and I stick by um, a belief that you should do this first, because if, you're, if your interview is going to change a lot, if your logic is going to change a lot, it's better not to waste time testing and perfecting that old logic that you're just going to change. So I think it really makes sense to review your script and make edits first. Um, and these might be edits um, for uh, just language edits. Um, there are some specific language edits that you should make because of the conversion. Um, and then you want to make sure that all of your forms are up to date and that um, if any changes in the law have happened, you just really need to make those changes. And this is a crucial step, and this is not a tech step. This is a subject matter step. Um, and it can take a while, depending on when your interviews were last reviewed and how much laws and forms have changed. Uh, the next step, once you have that, is that uh, you convert the, the interview, the A to J interview, from four to six, and you test it a few times to check for obvious errors. 
Um, this is a good time to modify those scripts to include the edits. Um, and then you want to make any modifications that you need to on the hot docs layer and then test that hot docs integration. Third, um, and so that's that step two is like a, is a very uh, quick and dirty sort of test. Um, it's the kind of test that's going to be done by your developer who is probably not your subject matter expert. Um, step three is where the real work happens. Um, the testing in A to J6 to make sure everything works properly. This is um, this is where the time goes and where the expertise, you have to have a mix of subject matter expertise um, and time um, to do this level of this layer of testing. Um, then you're going to work with your developer to revise the interview to fix any errors you found in testing. And then we go back and forth between steps three and four many times, test and revise, test and revise until you're ready to go live. And then um, you can, uh, you can, upload that the new A to J6 interview. Um, if you want to keep that same link uh, for stats purposes and so you don't have to go change every link everywhere you have it posted on your website, um, which is <laughs> I really recommend, just uh, upload the new um, interview files under the old link so that the, the transition is seamless from the user's end. Um, there is another Google Doc that we put together that really details um, all of these steps. Um, see if I can blow it up a little. Um, and this is shared with you all. It's anyone who has this link can view it. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but I, like what I just said was sort of like a really short version. Um, but this goes through a lot more steps and also links to other tools. And so. Um, we recommend printing out the script, reviewing it for accuracy and plain language, check um, the, for updates and specifically forms, check the logic. Um, here are some specific changes that need to be made because of the conversion. Um, you know, references to colors of hyperlinks, references to back and next buttons. Um, it's good to double check all your hyperlinks. Ensure all, every exit page has a hyperlink. Um, and then do any other cleanup you want to do. A lot of people are removing the gender question. Um, and, uh, you know, download your form instead of get document because the new the LHI button changed. So these are changes that you that you really should make, even if you even if you do nothing else, even if you say I this interview was was created six months ago, it's still up to date, still edit for these conversion specific changes. Um, and then we talk about converting the files, we link to instructions, um, some steps uh, to look for um, in that initial immediate error stage, um, test the interview flow in A to J author, test the assembly with hot docs, hot docs. Um, and we link here to uh, the places where you can look at known bugs and report new issues that you find in this process. Um, and then there's the, the longer testing process. Um, so this document is here for you as reference, um, and we hope that you find it helpful. Um, so who all is involved in this process? Um, a lot of people, and uh, so we have our subject matter experts. And so you might have a team of two people who cover all of these roles, but these are the roles that are involved. You need subject matter experts, someone in your state who knows the substantive law for the interview and can say whether the right forms are being correctly filled in and the questions are worded correctly. Then you need a project manager, someone who is in charge of your library, who can coordinate the work of all the other people invo involved and make sure that the work gets done. Make those assignments, do those follow-ups, keep everything moving. Um, the developer uh, might be an in-house staff person, a contractor, or one of our TIG funded volunteers who can do A to J conversions and or fix technical errors in interviews. Um, this is where you really need to have the, the A to J training um, to, to uh, make this happen. And then there are testers. And I believe everyone, you know, there get a lot of people involved in testing. So these are your staff. These are your subject matter experts. These are any students and volunteers you can corral. Um, TIG funded volunteers are people from my team who can help. You need a lot of testers and you need at least some of them who know and understand the substantive law behind each interview. Um, it's good to have some people who, 
don't know that substantive law to give testing as well because they can tell you what doesn't make sense or you might find um, you know, you might find uh, errors that way um, but you also do need some people who can do the testing and say oh uh, you know I said this and it should have checked this box but instead it checked this other box and so that's a problem that we need to fix so you really need a mix of testers so to add these two things together who does what uh, review the script and make edits that's your subject matter experts and your project manager um, convert from four to six do that initial um, script provision and hot docs integration uh, that's your developer's job um, and this is where Cali can help and where Michigan legal help um, can help uh, you need to test in A to J6 to ensure that all aspects work properly this is where your testers come in and your project managers and your SMEs and uh, Michigan legal help can provide some assistance in this but again we're not going to be subject matter experts um, in your law so we're in so we're going to be those non subject matter expert testers um, who can still provide some testing assistance um, and then that revising that testing and revising testing and revising is your developer again and again this is an area where Michigan legal help might be able to give you some assistance um, and then the you know the testers and the developer have to work together in that in the never-ending loop of testing and revision until you're ready to go live um, we have found um, that simultaneous testing and revising or editing is the most efficient way to do this um, rather than uh, you know people make doing a bunch of testing and then sending a bunch of edits to the developer who then makes them and sends them back um, we have found that sharing information and being able to do this simultaneously is the most efficient way um, and we use Google Docs to track our testing um, which is great because multiple testers and multiple developers can all be working off the same Google Doc and sort of see all of the errors that have been reported what's been fixed um, what still needs to be tested and so um, again Brett Harrison has created a really fancy um, we used to use a pretty basic version of this but he made it really cool and fancy um, so I'm going to show you one um, that we have been using um, so uh, every so every tester um, fills in the date their name what browser they used um, if they save their answer file what they saved it as um, the parameters this is supposed to be you know like okay I'm testing an application to set aside adjudication you know I said I was uh, I had I had uh, one felony and one misdemeanor um, it's been more than five years since I was convicted um, but I don't know the court I was convicted in and just so that you can see what fact patterns have been tested and you can if you need to try to recreate a test if they don't save the answer files um, there's a place to give feedback on the forms that were created um, there's a uh, there's a opportunity to give feedback on the interview the text of the interview um, there's a place to save screenshots so you can you know this is just a quick screenshot like oh there's a little typo here um, that's easy to fix and then uh, resolution date and comments when Brett goes in he says done he puts the date he crosses this off so any other any anyone knows that this problem has been fixed and so this just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on um, and uh, so the most recent tests show up at the top and the older tests show up at the bottom but having this history is really helpful because as an owner of this interview I can look through and see um, if you know uh, all of the different parameters have been tested um, I can see that everything that was fixed um, if it needs to be has been retested to make sure that it truly is fixed um, and these are great documents <laughs> I love attaching these long documents to my TIG reports. Um, I'm doing anything that's TIG funded and they want to see proof of our testing. Um, it's just really easy to just print this and attach it to your um, reports as a way of showing LSC how thorough your testing was. And multiple people can use it at once and add um, you know, their tests and their, and their remarks. So it's a very handy tool. This link right here 
uh, gives you a blank one. Again, you can only view this one, but you can um, save a copy for yourselves. We recommend one document per interview so that it's always clear. Um, I think at the top, um, yeah, at the top, there's this, this is the link to the interview. So anyone who's testing, you can just add them to the document. They know to click on that link, do the test, fill in the, fill in the form and, and keep going. So, um, and then this is the, this is the link that you would fill in um, here on your list when we say test log doc link. So that's your test log and you would cut and paste that link there um, so that when your developer comes in, they can easily say, okay, I'm gonna look at this one and see you know, what's new, what are the new problems in this interview. Um, so the big question that everyone wants to know is how long is this gonna take? Um, <laughs> how many hours, how much money? Um, and it's hard to say, but what I can tell you is our experience. Michigan has been working on this since April, um, and, I, and we worked on it before then, but I would say we were focused and strategic um, and really started putting the pedal to the metal in April or so. Uh, we have 27 interviews in our library, um, and I showed you this already. 14 are live, uh, three are in testing, and we have about 10 um, that we still have to go. And obviously, we're not working on this full time. Everyone involved in this project has multiple um, duties. And so, uh, but it, it has taken about, I, I looked up numbers quickly before I got on here, about 300 hours of staff time and 150 hours of developer time to get where we are today. And my staff, um, you know, that staff time counts everything. My staff are the subject matter experts um, and they are the testers and um, some of my staff do the development work as well. So the 300 hours of staff time includes um, all of those roles except developer, and the 150 hours of developer time is our primary developer time. There's a little, one of my staff does some development work, but um, at this point, it has been primarily Brett Harrison. Um, and your time will vary depending on the complexity of your interviews when they were last revised and the skill level of everyone involved. So um, these are just our statistics. Hey, Angela, can you give a sense of how much mm -hmm. time you spend on your catalog, not on the ones, like the ones that you don't have to convert or like before you started the conversion process? Didn't you, you still had kind of the same process of making sure they were still good or doing updating? Can you speak to like, to give some idea yeah. of before and after the conversion process? General. Like general so, upkeep of your time. General upkeep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, a lot of what we do in the conversion process is, is how we do our initial document creation process. Like when we're, when we're building a new interview, um, it's a comment, you know, like my staff, create the scripts and um, the forms and send them to the developer and then, and then they do the back and forth testing and revising testing and revising and that that process you know takes a very long time too in terms of upkeep um, uh, general maintenance um, you know anytime anyone reports a problem with an interview um, you know we get on it right away and make those changes um, we are informed anytime that we have uh, statewide forms in Michigan. So anytime the court, the state court administrative office changes the forms, we get a notification. And so we have to, you know, do those changes um, to the script and to the forms and the logic and then test and revise, test and revise, test and revise. Um, I don't have a great grasp on how many hours that takes. Um, but it, you know, it is significant. I mean, these libraries are significant to create and to maintain. Um, and I think that's one of the really big messages is that um, when you have a document assembly library, it's not just like you get a TIG and you build a couple tools and you put them online and, you, and you're done. Um, the maintenance really does you know, go on forever and you, you've got to keep um, updating your forms and updating um, your logic with any time any law or forms change or else you're sort of, I mean, I, I really believe you're doing a disservice to the public if you're giving them incorrect forms to use. Um, and so it is a significant 
um, amount of time. I wish I had better numbers. I it really varies so much. Um, um, you know, some interviews, our divorce interview is really, really, really complex um, and gets modified, I would say, quarterly at least um, because forms change. We think of better ways to say things. Um, you know, we just are always tweaking that. But some of our other interviews, um, we don't touch that often. If the forms don't change, we don't touch them that often. And during this process, we realized that we need to put our interviews all on a quality assurance review timeline, like all of our other content, um, because we hadn't looked at them in a while. And I think that um, the more responsible thing to do is to every year, you know, specifically take a look at each one of your um, interviews and make sure that, you know, just to review it for quality assurance purposes. Thanks. That was just what that, I was looking for. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah, it is like we're seeing um, a lot of we're seeing a lot of interviews like on our side that are that were like a TIG one off kind of project. And there wasn't necessarily that investment in quality assurance over the, you know, five years or eight years that it's been up. And so some of the conversion process we look at it as a good way for the legal aids to do that QA that might not have been done for a couple of years. So the 450 yeah. hours might scare some people, but that's really also kind of QA and revising the form that isn't necessarily intrinsic to the software itself. It's just kind of quality yeah. assurance of your, your product, just like any other web content you would put out there. It's true. It's true. And, um, you know, when I pulled up the number of developer hours, I specifically separated the A to J conversion from the other A to J author hours. Um, and it really, you know, like there's always a split there, He's always working on both. Like we just always, we are, always working on our interviews because that's really what it takes. Um, so yeah. Um, our goals for this project, um, when we, uh, our goals are that 50% of all A to J assemblies on LHI will be on A to J six instead of four um, by the end of this calendar year. Um, and the second goal is by June of 2019, 85% of all A to J assemblies on LHI will be done in six instead of four. Um, and these are aspirational goals, um, but we really, you know, the timeline is real. <laughs> you know, we really, we, we can't, uh, these interviews aren't going to work um, after a certain point. And so uh, we wanted to set aspirational goals so that we could really um, get people inspired to get moving on this. And, and one of the things to remember is that this doesn't mean that, you know, like there are two ways that we can reach these goals. One is by converting interviews and the other is by taking down interviews that are, that are no longer appropriate to be live because, you know, both of those things help our percentages. Um, if we look at, you know, it's it's six compared to four. So if you have some old interviews in four that you know you're going to decommission, decommissioning them um, can help us reach these goals. And if you have any in the library that are just sort of, we all have those in the library that are <laughs> that are not really good anymore. I might not even be live anywhere, but we just let hang out in the library. So um, it's a, it, and it, it, as Jessica said, it's a great time to do that quality assurance that's been needing to happen. It's also a great time to do some of that housekeeping um, that's been needing to happen. So what we want from you all um, is to determine the fate of each of your A to J interviews. I like to be dramatic. <laughs> um, develop a plan, timeline, and budget for conversion. Um, and this will help you get the resources um, that you need or um, convince uh, your funders and bosses um, that, you know, just to help them get a grasp of this project. Um, take advantage of the available assistance that we, that you can get from us and from Cali and work through your library to get things converted or decommissioned. And just a re recap of how we can help. Um, we can help you develop a plan. Um, I have worked with um, Illinois and with Arkansas um, in the last couple months to, to develop a plan and sort of a timeline and, um, this was the first time that I actually that I was able to put numbers to what it might take. And so I'm going to give that information to them as well. 
um, we can, Cali or Michigan Legal Help can help with that initial conversion step and in that, in that very quick uh, testing that happens to just make sure that there are no super obvious errors and fix those super obvious errors. Um, and then your staff will need to do a lot of that um, more refined testing, but Michigan Legal Help can provide some assistance. We have two A to J um, fellows uh, this summer who are assigned to work on this project with us and they can do a lot of uh, testing. Um, and we have money in our TIG budget to um, provide some assistance with developer work as well. Um, both Brett and um, uh, one of my staff people can do some help with um, the revision process as well. Um, so this is what I have. This is what I wanted to tell you about the A to J conversion process and uh, what we're trying to do with this TIG to um, help people uh, work through this process. And that's the end of my slides and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I guess I should have put one more slide. Um, if you do want to work with us um, and you want help, um, send me an email. Uh, my email is my last name, Tripp, T-R-I-P-P, -P, and then my first initial A, so T-R-I-P-P-A at mplp.org. Um, and I will, you know, we can set up a time to talk. Um, what I've been doing with Arkansas and Illinois is we have a check-in call once a month. Um, and we set goals for in between what, what's gonna, what we're going to do on the project for each month. And then, um, you know, we're just starting this project. So uh, we're going to work out some workflows in terms of like how we can provide the testing and developer assistance um, going forward. But um, we're happy to do that with anyone who wants to work with us um, within the constraints, as I said, within the constraints of our expertise um, and our budget, uh, we are, are happy to um, work with you. So if you're interested, and thanks Jessica for putting my email in the chat box. Um, uh, yeah, reach out and we can work together on this and together we can get it done. Thanks, Angela. Um, I shared all of the links that Angela had in her slides. So to their testing document, to the sample, um, the testing log one, the um, steps for conversion, and then the tracking sheet that she shared, those are all in the, in the chat. And I also put Angela's slide deck up there so you can go back through these if you're interested. Um, and then I'm going to unmute John Mayer, my boss, so that he has some comments. John, you're unmuted. Thanks, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Oh, excellent. I'm gonna ask my second question first because it's more interesting to me. Um, we're not the only ones that have to manage, um, you know, the law changing behind uh, legal processes and forms. How do the courts do this? Do they, do they tell lawyers when a form changes? Is there some sort of a official uh, method or is it like every court just sort of, you know, people learn by finding out the day after a, a, a form has changed? Um, uh, we have... Well, as I said, we have statewide forms, and so um, we're very lucky in that regard. And the State Court Administrative Office publishes, um, they, they have a calendar where they review, they have different subject matter area groups that meet once a year to do form revisions. Um, and they publish it on their website. You know, how many people pay attention to that? I don't know. Um, I think a lot of people do find out about new forms when they try to file an old form. Um, but they do, they try to, they do some, you know, you, you can sign up on email lists and things to get notifications, but. Well, cool. So that's obviously a, uh, an important place to check if you're looking to see if your form is up to date is go look at the yep. court's website to look and see if the, you know, something has changed since the last time, since, since you automated it in the first place. Right. And, you know, for us, it's really different because we didn't create the forms. And so it's really easy for us to check to see if a form is up to date because we just look at the date on the form. Um, but if you're creating your own forms, it takes a little more nuanced work to determine if your form is quote unquote up to date because you'll have to look at the law and at the general practice to see if that form is up to date. So um, it's sort of a double-edged sword. You can either just say decide like, sure. yep, this form is good. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about, you know, when they change the, hyphen in the title <laughs> and then you know make that change yourself so 
Cool. Well, my, my second question was, was um, it, it's just, was just more a thought that popped into my head is, is first of all, this is amazing stuff, uh, Angela. I, I love how it, you're, you're, you're such a process nerd and so am I, um, <laughs> Thank you. you know, and, and, and I couldn't help but think, well, what, what if this was, what if some of these ideas or these uh, checklists and such were actually incorporated into the A to J author website itself? So that if people want to manage the the form updating process, which is going to be an ongoing thing, it's built yeah. right into the tool. Yeah. You know, I I, I got to believe there's some there's some opportunities there for us to make uh, authors' lives you know a little easier. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. And just a second shout out to Brett Harrison who <laughs> made these beautiful, amazing Google Docs. But yeah, I oh, think Brett's they, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that they you know like this is the kind of stuff that you know, um, one of the reasons that I made it is that it, I want to, you know, like my learning curve since 2010 has been incredibly steep. Um, and, and I want to pass knowledge on to others as easily as possible. And so this is my way of doing that. Well, I want to also add that, you know, Callie stands ready to help anybody out. Um, besides Jessica, I've got two staff members who can do testing and, and uh, the, the, the baseline conversions. Um, and um, it's we, we've done enough conversions both internally and for other people that, that we haven't run into any major uh, problems in a long time. You know, we've, we've got we, we think we've got this scoped. So so it's not like there's going to be a, a big, uh, horrible, you know, uh, difficult technical pro process. Uh, the difficulty, uh, as you so well pointed out, is in did the law change and how does that change the, the script? of the questions and, and such. Yeah, and just and just really, you know, the the anytime you build a new interview, you've got to do a ton of testing to make sure that every every piece of code is exactly right um, and works exactly right. And when you do the conversion, even though there's no major problems, you might run into little blips, little things that have to be fixed. Um, you sure. Know, just, weird little stuff and so it's 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 that you know when you create a new interview that that testing and revising testing and revising loop is what takes the most time um, and the same is true for the conversion cool that's it for me okay I'm not seeing any so um, just a big thank you to Angela for coming and also for partnering up with us this year on the current tag it's been exciting to see her process um, and to learn yeah. new project management from you uh, as well yeah. and Brett and his awesome spreadsheets um, <laughs> and so if you do have any questions or comments you can feel free to reach out to me my email is on the screen jessica at cali.org um, and another shout out to please fill out that input survey um, this is one of our uh, grant requirements but we also do actually want the feedback from you guys so we get <laughs> um, we hear a lot of the squeaky wheels in terms of people um, that are, are not scared to share feedback with me and just email me, which I appreciate all the time. Um, but I wanna hear from all of you that are users. If you're new to A to J, or um, if you've been with us for a while, it's a simple survey. It takes like three minutes to fill out um, if you leave a lot of comments. So I really appreciate hearing from you. Otherwise, our next webinar will be the first Thursday of the month in uh, July. Um, I have to make sh check the date on that one because it might be um, the 4th of July, but I'll double check. I'll post it on the listservs um, and tweet it out. And as always, feel free to contact me. So thank you all for attending and thank you, Angela. All right. Thanks so much. It's been great working with you too. Thanks. All right. Have a good one. Bye, everyone.